Three, ah. two, one, go. Welcome to the Split Take Podcast. I am your co-host, Chandler. And I am your other co-host, Jacob Kaufman. And today we will be discussing the films Le Clisse and Brief Encounter. Le Clisse. Or Le Clisse. Le Clisse. We're, we're not sure which one it I don't is. know. Uh, yeah. Did you watch the the I TIFF tried. video? That's fine. <laughs> I tried so hard. I, I don't know if you noticed in the in the introduction, the the guy who was introducing the speaker yeah. pronounced yeah. it Leclise, and the speaker pronounced it Leclise. So again, it's I weird. still have I have no definitive pronunciation of that. But then. Italians aren't real, so it's fine. I just always go with the the French rule of you don't pronounce the last letter of the word. So I thought oh, it was Leclise. Uh, but but it also is Italian. Leclise sounds. I don't know. Nicolise. Um, which one are we going to do first? Brief encounter uh, or Cleese? We're going to do a brief encounter. So That's what I figured. Just, yeah. just a, a brief introduction before we get into all of that. So, of course, Laclise is our um, BFI movie of BFI. the BFI Sight and Sound Movie of the Week, directed by Michelangelo Antonioni. We have discussed. Who we have discussed before, yes. With uh, Blow Up, also on the, mm-hmm. the BFI list. Very excited to, to have that conversation. But first, we're going to talk about Brief Encounter. Now, this is a movie that I specifically paired uh, with Laclise. And when we we switch between the two of them, uh, so when we're done with our Brief Encounter review, I will explain why I put them together. Ah, uh, okay. But I think, needless to say, I think they're... Because it's not really like... I think they'd go together. Like, it's a fun pairing. I think it's more uh, interesting on, like, a filmmaking level because I think they are they are trying to do... Mm similar things in completely opposite ways they are they the yeah. opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of cinema and so i thought it'd be interesting to to pair them for that reason mm-hmm. but i'll go more in depth when we uh when we get to laclise so uh brief encounter tell us what what that's about i'm a happily married woman or rather I was until a few weeks ago. Brief Encounter is the story of a young English woman who has a chance encounter with an English man doctor, and they start a sort of, uh, <coughs> what turns into a, a a little friendship quickly becomes a essentially an affair. It is an affair. They're having an affair. Both uh, are unsatisfied in their marriages, so they start having these little meetings together every Thursday, and he wants to take it farther. She wants to stop. The encounter was brief, but the heartbreak is forever. That's the tagline of the movie. Help her. Uh, oh, no, please, it's only something in my eye. Try pulling your eyelid down as far as it'll go. And then blowing your nose. Please let me look. I happen to be a doctor. That's very kind of you. Oh, turn around to light, please. That's how it all began. Um, interesting. I thought this is an interesting film, um, specifically because... I mean, the director is David Lean, who is famous for just the biggest, epicest shit of all time. Director of Bridge on the River Kwai, Dr. Zhivago, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And not only is this so much smaller scale, but it's such a more intimate movie. Like, it's the complete opposite of something like Lawrence of Arabia. In terms of scale, yeah. most most so, Well, not, not just in terms of scale, presentation too, because Lawrence is the main character. We almost see him like a sort of Salieri Mozart type thing where he's the main character, but it's from the point of view of the people around him, kind of. Whereas this, you're in the main character's head. You're literally in her head. And it's just mostly her recalling her life uh, or, you know, her her affair with this man, um, just completely opposite of the big stuff. But I really liked it. I thought it was a really, really kind of perfect little movie. Um, it, it is. It's a very self-contained film because the the vast majority of the movie is just taking place within um, a train station, and they go a few other various locations uh, around there. But uh, that's the train station. Obviously, is where the titular brief encounters happen, for the most part. And uh, you have their home, and it's it, limited characters, and all that. Obviously, I, I don't know if you know this. It was a play first. Yeah, it feels very playy. Uh, in a still lot of life. Ways. But not in, not play. in a bad way. Yeah. yeah. And there was a lot of um, development from the play to the movie because it was a one act play. And I think the the 
one of the the bonus features or special features I, I saw in the Criterion channel, uh, the commentator said that it would be if you were to directly transpose the play onto the movie, it'd be only about 40 minutes long. So it, there was a lot That's of fleshing fair. out and, yeah. and Noel Coward, the, the playwright that Which is created funny. the story. Just a funny name. Yeah, Noel Coward. Coward. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he worked with David Lean. They had a partnership. David Lean actually directed, I think, a couple Noel, Noel Coward films. Uh, Interesting. Adaptations. Uh, this, yeah. I think, being the, the most successful, most well, most well known of all Noel Coward. Uh, inspired products. I'm honestly surprised I hadn't heard of this until you brought it up. Really? Never heard of this movie. No. Have you, what what else from David Lean? You've seen Lawrence of Arabia. I've only seen Lawrence of Arabia. I haven't seen, I've had Bridge on the River quite forever. But, you know, they're long movies. I want to see them, but you need to schedule your day around them. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, I've seen Lawrence, Zhivago, Bridge on the River Kwai. I feel like I've seen something else from them. Oh, but Lawrence is one of my, oh, yeah, yeah. Lawrence is one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, of course. And we're going to be talking about uh, Lawrence soon. soon. That's that's the other reason why I picked it. I thought it was uh, a good kind of primer to get more into David Lean, uh, an easy primer to David Lean, since all of his other movies are not particularly easy to watch um, because of their length. Uh, So, you know, a couple of weeks we'll be watching uh, Lawrence of Arabia and talking about that, maybe after October, because I I kind of get into Spooktober. Spooky. But that's neither here nor there. So Brief Encounter. What a what a film. I've seen it before. And yeah. when I first watched it, I was like, oh, that's that's fine. And it didn't you know, stick with me. Whoa. I didn't really I didn't really have much of an opinion on it. And obviously this time around it. It's great. It's really, <laughs> it's really, really great. I agree. Are you going to pictures this afternoon? Yes. How extraordinary so am I? I thought you had to be all day at the hospital. Well, between ourselves, I killed two patients by accident this morning, and the matron is very displeased with me. I, I simply don't go back. Such a such a, like an emotional film. Not necessarily in terms of what you're feeling. It, you could get emotional with it, but it's just yeah. like, every single scene is fraught with emotion from the characters and everything. And it's almost it's hard not to get yeah. kind of wrapped up with with everything going on. It reminds me of something like Chunking Express, where it's very literary. But it doesn't become it doesn't let that distract it from the fact that it is a film. There's a lot of beautiful little like uh, uh, reflections, little little poetry things that happen that accompany the visuals. One of my favorite things in the whole uh, movie is the after the titular brief encounter that they have uh, and the woman is on the train talking about how like she's kind of fantasizing. She's thinking of what the guy's going to do when he gets home. And he's ta- thinking about his wife and how his wife's going to be waiting for him on the stairs and how he's going to go up to his wife and say, I met the most peculiar or charming young woman today. And then she thinks to herself, oh, he's not going to say that. And that sort of sends her into the spiral of, you know, should they even be doing this? I wondered if he'd say. I met such a nice woman at the Cardoma. We had lunch and went to the pictures. And then suddenly I knew that he wouldn't. And you'll be on a shadow of doubt that he wouldn't say a word. But lots of beautiful little literary remarks that are matched with equally beautiful filmmaking. Because um, it's a lot of voiceover in this movie. And I think what... Yeah, it's one of the most effective uses of voiceover, I think, yeah. I can think of in, in the history of cinema. Yeah, voiceover in general. I don't completely understand the hate that voiceover... I understand why bad voiceover is hated. Yeah, but I think what makes this work is because it's framed as like a confessional, almost. That's how it all began. Just through me getting a little piece of grit in my eye. I completely forgot the whole incident. It didn't mean anything to me at all. At least I didn't think it did. Because it's a very interesting structure to this. Um, I love movies that recontextualize moments within themselves. The, be- oh, the beginning and the ending is the same. It's uh, the, it's their relationship is about to end. It's broken up by this really annoying, talkative woman. <laughs> and it begins with that scene. And you, just, you know, you don't get a lot of what's going on, but you can sense that some she walked into something heavy. And at the end, you see it from her perspective as the woman comes and fucks it all up. It's it, it gets a lot of mileage out of a very intimate, small story. And I think that's pretty great. Yeah, 
It's beautiful too. Yeah, it is a beautiful looking film. Wonderful black and white. And the, and the thing is, is like, it's, I just love, there's something very romantic aesthetically about the idea of a movie called Brief Encounter. It's so short. Like it's, it's just shy of 90 minutes. Um, yep. Like but even, even then, like the amount of screen time that uh, our, our two leads, uh, the romantic pair share together is, is probably little more than an hour. And so it feels all yeah. that more brief. And I think the, the, the real benefit of the, both the, the, the framing of, of starting with the end and then kind of going back and not just going back, but seeing everything from her perspective is really getting into to her emotional point of view for the duration of that narrative. And I think given that the, the voiceover is so fraught with perspective and memory and, and reminiscing um, and nostalgia, that that's really what makes the voiceover so, so effective is it's not just telling you, it's, it's giving comment and it's yeah. after the fact. Um, and so you get that kind of doomed love affair feeling throughout the the whole thing this this air of melancholy this is of course mm-hmm. another of the 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 great cinematic legacy of of doomed love affairs which tend to be some of the most well regarded romantic films like i was about to say big in the mood for love's vibe yeah like this thing yeah. in the mood this for is love. Oh, very similar oh i'm so excited i'm so excited speaking of in the mood for love Allow me to do a quick digression before we continue with reviewing the film. So I was thinking, I'm getting a lot of in the mood for love vibes from this. Let's list all of them. <laughs> and there was a a, a shocking amount of uh, of of things that were were similar. Uh, music boxes and radios feature prominently. Like uh, diegetic music is in both. Of course, uh, meeting in cafes. Uh, reflection slash mirror shots, uh, gossip and the expectations of society affecting relationship, an unseen wife from the the guy and uh, the guy, husband yeah. is largely irrelevant in the story. Um, feelings, feelings creeping up on the couples. They just kind of find themselves in the midst of a romance that they, they didn't intend to get into. Um, there's woman fun- rejects man woman pursues rejects. funny side characters you have the character of ping in uh, in the mood for love and you have the the love duo ping. the uh the train conductor the bartender and the, lady yeah the cafe lady oh was he a train conductor i thought he was a policeman there was a there was there was a a janitor whatever an, an employee of the yeah. train station yeah uh scarfs feature prominently newspapers lots of rain uh mm. running in the rain i wrote that one down uh other couples slash people reveal the main relationship so how like there there are other examples in in the mood for love of like the neighbors and the and how they act versus how the, the main characters act mm-hmm. uh repetitions of shots and locations feature very like prominently in both stirring of coffee yeah uh, yeah Walking Almost together, good. holding hands. Um, and then the last one being some, one of the characters claiming that it's all been uh, a purely, it's not been a relationship. It's just been purely, they're just friends. They're just friends. They're clearly not just friends. Mm-hmm. Clearly. So quite, quite a few similarities between the two movies. I, I had fun thinking of all those. I couldn't help but think of like why I like in the mood for love a little better. Mm-hmm. Um, again, they're completely different movies. So yeah, they they're going for different. kind of a different feeling. Yeah, yeah. But they approach the story um, kind of similar. Similarly. Yeah, uh, I do love the main guy who we've seen before in the mm-hmm. Third Man, which is interesting because I was, I was I don't know if you saw there's a uh, uh, Mark Kermode did a small video on Brief Encounter as part of oh, the BFI introduction oh. thing. He did, yeah. Uh, I should and watch he that. Voted it's good it's like three or four minutes um he said that in 1998 or 99 it was voted the number one best british movie of all time or no number two number two followed by the third man which i thought oh that guy's in both cool cool yep and of course third man is the better of the two i agree well yeah at least third man's just perfect yeah 
Well, nothing, nothing beats the pronunciation of cuckoo clock. <laughs> I mean, if you have Orson Welles in your movie, your movie instantly goes up ten points in the in the ranking. It's All true. things well, being equal, Transformers. All yeah. things being equal between Brief Encounter and and the Third Man, Brief Encounter does not have Orson Welles, so they're not equal. Yeah, it's 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 a movie I would like to come back to. Um, it's 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 so simple. And I think mm-hmm. what's really going to make me appreciate it more is just it's not flashy filmmaking, but it is wonderful filmmaking. A beautiful transition is when it's, it transitions to like uh, her sitting in the bottom right corner of the frame in like the dark. And then they do like a transition from the previous scene to her sitting in that same spot, but in her room with her husband, like in the background. I don't know if you remember that one in particular, not but it's just I don't even know how they fucking did it. Hi, Laura. Yes, dear. If you were miles away. Well, I wonder which one of one of the YouTube essay channels did a video about David Lean transitions. I can't. That was was. uh, Royal Ocean Film Society. I think uh, yeah, that's who I thought it was. Which, by the way, cringe because that guy gave this a three out of five. They cringe. Looking at Uh, you. I, I remember thinking to myself about halfway through the movie is like, oh, David Lean, he's known for his transitions. And I was like, oh, that transition I just saw, that was a pretty normal average transition shot. Let me pay attention specifically to the next one. And the next one was like, oh, oh, what a good cut. <laughs> You're very angry, aren't you? No, Alec, not angry, just disappointed. I love it. it one of damn good transition. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It is. It's so love simple. It. And I think that's really what it's 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 staying power is where it was built off of just the the kind of archetypal relationship and the emotions and all that and unrequited love of. Um, almost trying to like capture a bit of your your youth with having this this mm-hmm. fling and all that. And then, of course, uh, filmmaking wise, other than the uh, transitions and, and David Lean's editing, the the lighting so and thick, yeah. the 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 atmosphere, lots of smoke, fog, trains, I trains, love me a train. Um, great. A little cafe. Great. I'm going to use this word again for Laclise, but great chiaroscuro lighting, lots of shadows and nighttime. Yeah, it's interesting that this is a setting. It's like a it's like a it's a romance film Mm -hmm. but it's it looks and feels like a noir which i think times to that tragic tone to Mm -hmm. it all because you know a lot of noirs have to do with complicated histories memory that sort of thing but uh it's very solid what a picture no no thing it's very lean (laughs) that's that's pretty good pretty good (laughs) i like it Uh, the other thing that's obviously very very famous about um a brief encounter is its its film score is by uh the russian film composer rachmaninoff and mm. what what beautiful music it is i'm uh, you know most people our age are not particularly uh, familiar but rachmaninoff is probably one of my favorite composers and his music is just oof. It's very, it's very romantic. And, and, what are you talking about? Everybody loves Rachmaninoff. Yeah, yeah. Everyone knows Rachmaninoff. Crazy. Of course. Everyone knows Rachmaninoff. I actually forgot this, this um, uh, Rachmaninoff's uh, Symphony Number no. Two, whatever it is. It's, it's the one at the very beginning of um, Brief Encounter. Um, I actually forgot that Rachmaninoff was used in, in Brief Encounter entirely. And I was thinking of uh, good music to put in movies, and thinking of like ideas coming up with story script ideas and it's like that's a that's a piece of music i think would be great for a movie and then here it is david lean beat me to the punch that motherfucker 80 years it could be it could be one of those songs that's used multiple times there's only a few movies i think that take complete and total ownership of a song that they're so iconic that you can't use them anywhere else this one you could probably 
Oh yeah, yeah, most certainly you could, most certainly. And it's it's actually a uh, um, the the recording. The sound is a bit it's a bit older, so it's not quite as crisp and clear. Um, yeah. And so the 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 more modern recordings that you might hear on Spotify have like a more fullness and a robustness to it that mm-hmm. is like it's missing a little bit. It's not quite the the pure yeah. perfect sound of, of Rachmaninoff. But that's enough of me revealing my my taste in classical music. Back to the film. It's a great movie. I'm honestly surprised it it probably did well. I, I bet some people voted for it on the BFI list. Yeah, you know. Uh... I think it was after watching this because, you know, after we watch all these movies, I mentally think to myself, does it deserve to be on it? And then after watching this, I'm like, wait, which one was supposed to be the BFI movie again? This or Laclise? <laughs> Honestly, didn't remember. So that's a oh, good. Uh, uh, this lad, I recommended a good movie to watch, um, which is especially surprising when you consider David Lean's a hometown hero. I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, given that, you know, of course, British, it's a, it, it clearly won other or placed very highly. In oh, yeah, I don't know. Best British it might have even been time. the BFI who voted on that list I was t- telling you about. But yeah, interesting. I think the, the BBC um, did is, polls like that. Yeah, that might have been it. Is uh, Arabia, is that the only David Lean on here? I'm assuming, because if we're getting to that and we haven't gotten yeah. to the other ones. Okay. Brief encounter. Kind of I will be able to pull it up momentarily, see who voted for it on sight and sound i'm assuming it's on here i'd be surprised if it wasn't bridge on the river why is on here there it is brief encounter 11 critics and three directors so it, it placed like 154 154 that's not too bad well no. all things considered uh <laughs> we were just talking about our good friend kenneth brana not, Does he vote for it? Friend, but he, we were talking about him today in his new movie. We we uh, respect Kenneth Branagh. I love Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> so do I. Trash and all. I do. Uh, <laughs> such great, He's a great funny stuff. Man. But he voted for it. Doesn't surprise me at all. And do I recognize any of the Was he on the director? Yeah, I guess he is a director. Yeah. I don't re- really recognize any of the, the critics enough to make note. But okay. So it did get, it did get a, a, a sizable... Uh, vote on the poll interesting it's a really really great movie very much recommended it. it's on the criterion channel you can get the criterion blu-ray um such does this one have a 4k no why would it don't know why i asked that not that's cool that it has yet a, yeah that's good I, I was actually wondering if it had a blu-ray I, I might pick that up really simple soulful romantic movie um it's it's one of those films like you think of like classic great classic movies in all their glory all their black and white old-timey glory this is this is one of them and one of them that that still holds a uh, emotional punch today so Mm -hmm. great movie very much recommended classic Now let's go to another simple, not complicated movie. Yes, a simple, not complicated movie at all. I am so excited to talk about this week's BFI Sight and Sound movie of the week, which is the Italian film La Clice. Which I think we're just going to go with that pronunciation from now on. Here's the criterion. Yeah, sure, why not? which I have. I have quite a few Antonioni criterions. I'm a big fan of his. Interesting. Um, as a director, it oh. wasn't always the case. And I actually watched an Antonioni last night that I hated. But we'll get into that. <laughs> I saw later. that. I saw that. I was going to write a hated, hated. review. Hated. I was like, eh. I don't have it in me to, that's, to actually that's criticize. That's the thing is that... Okay, so yeah, movies look please. Um, I'm, I'm afraid. Whenever we discuss Antonioni now, um, I, I just wanted to say I like this movie. Um, I know you recommended me a video about this guy talking about it. it I got it, about it twelve would, minutes into it. It would. I got pretty it wasn't far into help it. In in like yeah, appreciation yeah. or anything like that. It just was. It will. Pa- yeah, I wasn't necessarily watching it to further my appreciation because I I'm I responded much better to this than my first watch of Blow Up. Uh, um. Uh, because now I kind of understand that 
he more than any filmmaker i think that i've seen so far you really have to engage watching this um yeah it's i i put antonioni in a a very small group of directors with um yasujiro ozu and godard directors who uh regardless of what you think about them um just did their own thing and their own thing is so unique and so uh never really replicated i put cassavetes on at all too yeah yeah to a certain extent um maybe maybe not so much i don't know it's probably like an Eng- like an american bias that i think there's something just inherently familiar about movies in the english language that even if the yeah. most uh, uh transgressive cassavetes film is still more familiar than you know a godard film yeah, um, yeah maybe true. i don't know i'll ruminate on that that is an interesting uh addition but like that, he is a director who has a, a genre, a world, an aesthetic, uh, cinematic expression that is entirely unique, that has never been really replicated. And he is a, a very intellectual director. And obviously, we, we discussed uh, Blow Up, uh, which was also on the Sight and Sound list. Uh, you can watch that episode or listen. We both like Blow Up. And Laclise is uh, the movie he made a couple of years earlier. It is the the third film in a, a informal trilogy, uh, which we will be La Ventura, Laclise. You missed the I middle one. The middle one was La Notte. No. Okay, so they're all La. Uh, uh, well, yes. Well, Le. This is Le, technically. Le. Well, well, well. <laughs> uh, all of these, the, mm. the films are starring uh, Monica Vitti. Uh, who was uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's muse as an actress. Very, very pretty woman. Oh, gorgeous. Absolutely. She's just... The, you have to be really hot if I'm looking away from Alain Delon. That's <laughs> how is, hot you gotta this be. Because he's uh, also... Oof. When I was oof. in uh, the screening for In the Mood for Love, uh, Jeff Yank giving his little uh, speech beforehand was like, this is such a, a hot couple on screen with Tony <laughs> Leung like and like and I was like yeah these two though <laughs> I it might be I, I thought of, the like, same thing this is like I was thinking to myself who's who's the hotter couple Maggie Chung Tony Leung Alan Delon Monica Vitelli I don't know I don't know recency bias makes me want to say uh, the Italians but quick tangent yeah is Al- Alan Delon he's French not Italian. I think he's he's French Italian uh, because he's in the samurai. But he's, he's, he's in this. He's in the leopard. Yeah, he's French. I feel like he has to be French. Yeah, but you know, maybe they, he speaks Italian too. I don't know. Oh, oh, most certainly. You know, they're they're a bit more cultured and and language learned in Europe, and then we are here. True. They don't. They don't. Uh, so they don't really teach you languages I'll just, in America. They try to. No, the education they, they system's they, heart they, isn't in it. Uh, no. Yeah. So I'll just say this. Yes. Uh, I'll need you to take the reins here because I have nuggets of <laughs> of interpretation. But I'll be honest, I like this movie a lot. I have no fucking clue what it was about. I mm. honestly have zero clue. The novelist and literary critic Umberto Eco referred to Leclise as a movie about a useless and unlikely love affair between useless and unlikely characters. Um, but it's not so much that there's nothing to spoil as that there is nothing to spoil. <laughs> and that's why I, I start with this image. That I don't want to spoil the nothing for you. And that guy didn't necessarily open any doors in my mind yeah, listening to him speak. He, he, but the, the, the introduction that he was giving was an introduction. It was for people who hadn't seen the movie, so it wasn't at all about trying to unpack okay, yeah. the, the narrative mm-hmm. and all that. But... Just to, to finish up real quick. So we have uh, La Ventura, which we'll be watching later on in the podcast for the sight and sound list. Um, I will also mandate that we watch La Note to finish out the trilogy. Might as well. Might as well. And this is the the third in the informal trilogy. Um, and it's it's informal because it's they're all black and white. They all have Monica Vitti. And they're all, to greater or lesser extent, about the uh, alienation in modern society. Modern for the 60s. Um, and, and although I think it still has, has relevance in terms of the, the phrase modern, given that it's about yeah. the, the proliferation of, um, the middle class about wealth, 
uh, about moving away from tradition, uh, the, the traditional mores of like traditional marriages, um, of, of this is a, a time that's after World War II. Uh, very specifically in like Cleese, there are uh, uh, allusions to, to nuclear war in it. It is, of course, taking place during, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis times and all that kind of stuff. So it is also a trilogy of um, existentialism and what it means to be alive in a kind of modern, the alienating modern world and all that. And it sounds yeah. very cerebral, and it is. But I think there's something about it is. Antonioni that um, works on an emotional level, that, that it isn't just a overdose of intellectualism, which it, which it can be. And it, it's, it's hard to, to really start unpacking him because I, I suppose you could just talk forever. And that's one of the things, it's one of those movies. Um, I'm going to say right out of the way, if you, if you like cinema, like it, I highly recommend this movie. It is, I think it might be more approachable than the other two. I'm not sure though. Um, and at the very least, the two main actors are, are, hot enough that that will keep your interest even that's true. The, the, true the rest of the film doesn't. and you know what it's 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 a movie because i remember blow up i was just i was bored and confused um and this i was just bored i'm just confused <laughs> <laughs> i was not bored because i again as far i i now that you're saying these things um one of the things that i definitely picked up on was the commodification of life um it's it, you know buildings are being built the stock exchange people are just you know yelling and screaming and all they care about is numbers and money and wealth um i always felt that monica's character uh was sort of com commodified in a certain way being the wife of a writer obviously his exper her like experiences with him have sort of been distilled i assume into literature that was sold for money and then i think the scene that really sort of turned me uh, in this direction was after Alain Delon's uh, car is wrecked by that drunk guy. And he immediately starts talking about like, you know, I could still sell it for a good amount. The damages won't cost that much. I only bought it for 5,000 or whatever. And she's sort of just like calls him out for only thinking about the numbers, the, the statistics and the money. Um, so obviously there's this thread of commoditization everywhere, but I think the, the best parts of this movie to me, even though I don't understand them, I love watching people shout at the stock. <laughs> it's just so much fun. This is uh, some of the best Italians shouting in cinema. So great. Entire sequence so great. is devoted to, to that. Mm. Yeah, but that's the thing is that like, I'm watching it. I'm watching all these people shout at the stock market. Prices going up, prices going down, sell, buy, whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, this probably means something. I don't know, but it's fun. I like watching people shout. <laughs> I don't know anything about stock markets. I don't know how they work, but it's fun. Makes me wonder if this was uh, one of the movies that Marty watched for Wolf of Wall Street. To oh, I'm, I'm pretty. I know Marty is a fan of, of Antonioni. I think there's a video on YouTube of him talking about uh, Antonioni. And Marty just likes movies. Yeah. 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 But, you know, a fellow Italian and all. And true. true. So. You know, it, it's you can't really recommend uh, an Antonioni just to just to anyone, just to your common film goer. Because there is a lot going on and he is a filmmaker who deliberately, uh, gleefully almost avoids. Traditional narratives, traditional structure the the connective tissue between scenes and the plot is um is there but not in the way that you would expect um and he is a director who as as, as you mentioned earlier you you have to pay attention to and not necessarily uh because you you, you must pay attention to in order to get the plot because there isn't really a plot to get especially no, in, it's, in the cleese yeah you have to pay attention to him in order to to get something out of the experience of watching the film. How is it all? Connected? Yeah. You can just kind of zone in and out and, and watch beautiful Monica Vitti and Alain Delon as they, they slowly start a relationship very slowly. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of like the, 
the overview and I'm struggling as to, as to where to, to begin. And I'm, I'm curious of ask, posing this question um, as, you know, I, I, to put my cards on the table, I love this movie. I think it's a really great movie. It's, it's one of the most interestingly constructed films, at least on a, on like a, a jigsaw puzzle level. But at the same time, I'm not sure there's anything to get. And that's one of the things I really like about Antonioni is he, he puts a lot of ideas out there and a lot of um, uh, he kind of creates these interesting characters and then sets them loose into a, a world uh, that is also an interesting character in and of itself. As, as you said, like alienation and modern society. So he very much leans into that. And there's a sense of the broader world and of our characters living in it. And I guess I I, I want to know when you say you you are confused, what what was your experience watching? Like, how would you describe the plot for you as you experienced it? The plot. Well, you know, obviously it's a simple story. Monica Vitelli breaks up with or leaves her husband boyfriend um it's i think they were married no. oh that's right she said she wasn't married that's right right yeah you know, leaves her boyfriend um sort of wanders um does blackface for a little bit meets <laughs> alone de <Delon. laughs> yeah oh man it's just a little bit of blackface just a little bit <laughs> it happens um well he meets with alan delon and then they get together sort of kind of maybe don't know um but yeah it's just a lot of scenes where i'm interested in what's happening i enjoy the filmmaking and i'm trying to think to myself what is really happening here what does it mean how i know i i have a strong feeling that all of these scenes are ideologically and thematically linked i'm just trying to find those links same way i did with blow up um, and again, going on that that, that uh, commoditization level, that also explains the uh, blackface mark <laughs> of this narrative. <laughs> yeah, it's the blackface is an interesting scene, especially if you're approaching it nowadays. Um, and I, I think, you know, if you are, oh man, I- ignorant of of Antonioni as an artist, and, and maybe are are trying to read uh, malintent into it. That, that you might take an issue is. with it. Uh, but I think the the point of the, the blackface is to to show ignorance and discontent and um, or content contentedness in ignorance of of modern life and a lack of connectiveness. To, well, yeah, to that what you're doing, because that whole scene to me, it feels like they're they're uh, The characters are using the Kenyan culture as a prop, as a toy. They're dressing up, they're playing dress up, they're playing tribes people or whatever, talking about culture, uh, bringing culture to this land or whatever. And to me, it it does um, sort of echo these themes of, of uh, you know, uh, reality slipping away. I think another interesting thing is that this movie, um, when you compare the, the time between this and going back 13 years to Bicycle Thieves is not that long. I mean, 13 years is a long time, but when you look at like Italy in Bicycle Thieves, where you still have all this romantic, uh, older architecture post-war, obviously it's a little fucked up, but you still get that sort of feeling and that classic feeling. And then you get into these modern buildings, which are gross. <laughs> the the modernist design, everything's kind of almost brutalist. It's just. blocky and without any sort of identity or romance to the way they were constructed it's completely different italy and you can feel especially in that last like montage last like two or three minutes where it's just nothing but like shots of italians being italian <laughs> in uh in this little city over some really oppressively weird music and sound it it's obvious that he he is an Italian who holds contempt for his uh, for, <laughs> for his fellow Italian or, or it, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'd go so far as to say contempt, although I think at certain points he's he's 
really questioning the the, the purpose and point of, of some things that are, are developing out of modernity. But the thing with with between this and blow up, because um, blow up uh, is uh, probably more accessible given that it's, it's English and all. Um, but thematically, I think that yeah. blow up is, is a lot easier to unpack. I think there is something to unpack there. Um, I don't think that there's anything specific or concrete to unpack with Licklis. I think it is just a exploration, a questioning, a a trying to to dig into and and get it at um, just a, just exploring with the characters and all that. And the the it's interesting that you brought up bicycle thieves because you you could say that there's a a hint of neorealism in this in this film. Um, and it's just just a hint. It's like a dash, a pinch of neorealism. Um, but one of the things that the I watched this twice, technically, I, I watched the commentary, commentary. Um, over the course of a couple of days. For a good chunk of it, I was literally just looking at the TV, watching the movie with the commentary parts of it. I wasn't so, you know, I felt there was enough to, to log it again on Letterboxd. But that being said, at one point, the, the commentator talked about um, Antonioni's uh, start in filmmaking started with the documentary filmmaking. And I Makes think you, you can you can get a good sense for that in, in all of his movies of uh, portraying uh, real uh, work like labor often has a lot to do with his movies. Obviously, in the beginning of blow up starts with uh, the, the main character taking just after a night of taking photos of, of factory workers um, and posing as one of them. And in here, the labor is it's not necessarily strictly labor. But it is a job, and the job is the stock market, and that's what he is very kind of passionately examining. Um, and I think there's again, it's just an exploration. I think you can read a lot of different things into how he's just portraying it, and the and he's not trying to get anything specific, which is why I think this is a, a movie that I will just continue to rewatch and get something different, or, or look into it, yeah. or, or approach it in a different way, because um, you most definitely could approach it from. I don't know, maybe a feminist angle. Certainly you could approach it from a, a capitalist Marxist perspective and trying to dig at the film from that angle. Um, and it's, in that sense, it's not didactic. And I think that's what helps the, the movie and, and the Michelangelo's, uh, Antonioni's background in documentary filmmaking is, is what helps with that is because a lot of the, the filmmaking is focused on expressing people and faces and and actions and particularly in the the scenes in the the bursa the roman stock exchange um those are actual uh stockbrokers for the most part and antonioni filmed on the weekend in the the actual stock exchange when it's closed and he invited them all back and said, hey, you work here, so come back on the weekend when you're not working here. And you can just shout at each other like you normally do, uh, but with no <laughs> stakes. Um, and of course, you know, Monica Vitti and uh, Alain Delon, not actual stockbrokers, but they fit in very, very nicely into th this world. And so he's using real locations, real people, um, the the... The film is is set around a series of of dichotomies of tradition versus old, uh, or traditional versus new, um, man woman uh, alienation and being a part of something relationships. You know you have the stock exchange, which is a part of uh, old Rome. It, it's actually taking place. the The building that they built the stock exchange in is a uh, Roman dates back to Roman uh, Roman times. Hmm. And obviously it's been like built and changed and, and served different functions over the many hundreds of years since then. Um, but then you also have contrastingly this new neighborhood, which you're talking about, and it's uh, the, the Hoyer, the Ewer neighborhood, uh, which originally, interesting, I think you, you hit the nail on the mark where it's kind of like almost brutalist. It was a neighborhood that was started by uh, uh, Mussolini under the, the fascist years. And the very interesting oh, mushroom- classic. Water tower is an actual water tower, although in this film it almost takes on a, a mushroom mm. cloud like uh, symbolic appearance. But it, it, yeah, it, 
it features very prominently in that whole neighborhood, which essentially represents the nouveau riche, the new money after the, the, the war, post-war boom and all that. And there is this interesting dichotomy between the, the new buildings and the old of Italy. Um, and there's lots to, lots to say and unpack about that in particular. But with that, that, you know, that documentary um, perspective, and, you know, it's interesting. As I'm talking about it, I'm not really, unlike with, with a Brief Encounter, where I'm, I approach that film as, like, trying to, to explain what I like about the movie, uh, what I think works aesthetically. It's interesting that, that Antonioni's style is so different that I'm not even worried about defending the film aesthetically or not. No. That it, it's more so just trying to, like, because the process of explaining it and talking about it is is interesting in and of itself, at least to me, as I am trying to to unpack after I think I've watched it like four or five times. And yeah, it just, it has it has the roots in just looking like a documentary, but it moves and it cuts the editing and the way the camera moves and the uh, the, uh, the actors are blocked. It feels very meditative and dreamy almost it's a, it's a weird juxtaposition of, of visuals and uh, tones it does feel very much his own it's very slow very slow but in a way that is weirdly quick. I don't know. It's strange because I this is a l- decently long movie, two hours, six minutes, but I never really felt the length. Maybe I'm just used a little more to Antonioni's style, but uh, I don't know. It, it, it didn't feel like a bunch of really long scenes. It felt like four or five really long scenes, which if you're going to make a slow paced movie, that's probably the way you should go. Yeah, maybe mm-hmm. just so because so many of the locations start to blend after a while in a good way. Mm-hmm. You know, the first whole sequence of uh, Monica Vitti and her, her boyfriend in the you know, it's almost the night afterwards of their their breakup yeah. as they're going through that whole process. It's like a 20 minute long sequence. It doesn't feel like that. I watched it mm-hmm. like three times just because I started the movie and I was like, OK, I can't. I'm too tired. I can't give it the, the proper attention it needs. So then I returned to it the next day and I actually watched the movie. And then of course I watched it again for the, the commentary. Um, but that, that opening scene sequence just so long. And yet it just flies by. I always press the little, uh, how long am I into the movie when that ends? Cause it's so self-contained it's like and it just minutes. kind of yeah. lulls you into the whole movie. And honestly, I don't think there's a line spoken for the first couple minutes of the movie that just, the two of them are just wandering around the the apartment, um, and it really, I think, establishes early on the the, the theme of alienation and, and trying to find a connection and not finding one. I don't know. I don't really want to ramble here because I could, as with blow up, just continue <laughs> to talk about individual elements of the movie. And that's that's really, you know, when you pa- unpack what I love so much about watching a, an Antonioni film is. Being able to to see something. And pay attention to the same thing and see it in a new way or pay attention to something different in a new way. And and looking at the details is rewarding if if you want to. Um, and, it, you know, I know you've said about movies before that I know there's deeper meaning, but I don't care to look into it. And, you know, I, I care. here. Yeah. But even then, I think there's something I think it's worth a worth a watch, even if you're not interested in engaging with it all that much. Um, because there there is something. Regardless of if you're going to give that much effort into it, of actually like looking at the details, even if you don't want to do all that, even if you're just watching it as a film lover. You will find it interesting in, in the way that Antonioni clearly is is 
ignoring traditional narrative structures. And I think in a way that succeeds for the most part, even for someone who's not used to that kind of uh, transgression. Um, and it's, you know, for me, it, it satisfies the, the very intellectual part of my brain. And even then there's something emotionally impactful. Um, not, not like emotionally in terms of like brief encounter was emotional, but, uh, getting invested in, in figuring, looking into the world, like the world has sucked me in. It is very much a, a film that creates a version of reality in itself, its own little mm -hmm. fantasy world which you know, all films do, but this one, it, it has its own feeling and, and characteristics to it. He's the thinking man's David Lynch. Yeah. To to make note of of actual aesthetic things, uh, the the cinematographer for this film, I think it was Gianni De Venanzo, who is one of my favorite cinematographers. He did uh, uh, Eight and a Half, and um, this is is just one of the best looking black and white movies. Um, beautiful lighting. Hold on one moment. Uh, <laughs> Hold on. What? I accidentally unplugged my mic. So while Chandler is exporting, and uh, only my audio counts for this this moment in time, uh, I will say that I watched Red Desert last last night. This film, Michelangelo Antonioni's Red Desert. This is the film he made after Le Clis and before Blow Up. I'm recording again now. By the way, I'm wonderful. That now. Uh, Red Desert is his. Uh, First film in color. It is a movie I've tried to watch many times before, given that I'm a fan of Antonioni. Uh, I get 10 minutes in and I say to myself, this is intolerably boring. This is the film I think of when you first watched Blow Up and thought it was confusing and boring. Mm. This is this is what I was like, oh, this is what Chandler. It's interesting that he's able to ride the line so well. Yeah. Um, is that I, the American one? I know he did some American ones. Uh, no, this is. Uh, Sometimes it is in, informally roped into the the other three, uh, yeah, Lecleese and all that, because it's it's starring Monica Vitti. Still, it's an Italian film. I'm not really sure if I can pinpoint exactly like what what the difference is that is so starkly like it just doesn't interest me at all, and I just I don't think it's yeah. well made at all. That's a not not in terms of like visually, because obviously yeah. Antonioni is such such a great director at, at filling the frame with interesting images um and it is filled it's a movie filled with interesting images and he does use color well and i think the 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 two things that i can pinpoint that are lacking in red desert that make me appreciate something like lickley's more um character wise i don't think the characters are um as fleshed out um and that's interesting like the you know, if you're watching like Lisa for the first time, you might say, oh, they, they don't seem like terribly in-depth characters. But watching Red Desert, it, there's just something um, almost superficial. And I almost feel like he was going for something more like a uh, blank slate kind of trying to capture more of society within a character. But I don't think it, it worked out for him in uh, Monica mm -hmm. Vitti. I also don't think her performance is particularly interesting. Um, but the other thing that I think didn't really work for me is that his use of color. It was a little on the nose. Um, he, was, hmm. he was using it very expressively in, in Red Desert, and they're great frames, but it seems like a little like he's leaning too much into the intellectualism, like obvious intellectualism. And that's the thing that I would describe that I, I think works so well about the police is that it, it is clearly a, a movie you, you have to think about, but it's not on its face an intellectual film. Mm -hmm. like, you, you know, like you, you might watch a movie and it's like, oh. I'm supposed to be thinking now and that's boring. And that's what, that's what I got from red desert. That's the feeling I got of like, a, I have to think, I have to think about this. Whereas look, least I can think about it, but I can also enjoy it for what it is. And it's aesthetically character wise, emotionally, all that kind of oh, stuff. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
does it deserve to be on the BFI list? This one? Yes, uh, Lick Lease. No, please comment on I'm gonna say no. <laughs> I'm going to say no, just because I, I know we're going to at You're one saying, point revise. I don't know if, yeah, I, I don't know if we've publicly revised it. You are saying yes to blow up now, right? I will say yes to blow up. Okay. Yes. I'm saying no to Laclis. Not because I don't like it, but because you need to, I need to more than like it. <laughs> I liked it a lot. It was very good, but um, no. I, I can't blame you too much for that. Oh, I won't get upset. It's a movie I don't feel the need but to defend yes? because it's it's such a good movie. I'm gonna say yes. Okay, ding. That's a split take. It's a split take. It's interesting. I'm going through like a uh, a mental process of which one of the three I like best. Um, because I think I, I think inevitably I'll be able to convince you that you should put two Antonioni movies on the list. Blow up as his English <laughs> I'm movie. Sure I will. And That's one the of the thing is that. Next time we get to when we get to Laventura because or whatever the other one is blow up as a color film. It just feels like clearly same director, but it just feels very like its own kind of doing its own thing yeah. later on in his career. Um, yes, it's either this or Laventura. I think I really love La Note too, but. It, it's a movie Good trilogy. That, solid trilogy, solid trilogy. Yeah, be curious to, to rewatch La Ventura eventually. It was on my favorite movies of all time list for for a while. Um, and I think I remember that. I think with all Antonioni movies, I need to be reminded of of them. Like I need to watch them, and then over time, I kind of forget and think, "Oh, well, yeah. that's a lot of thinking. I, I can't do that right now." So we'll push you off my favorite movies list. So there's a recency bias that goes into every single film. That's the other thing when you say like you need to love a movie, and that's the thing. Like I, I don't love any Antonioni film. I don't get to the end of Laclis and say, "Oh, wow." What, what an emotionally investing picture. What cinema? What? Yeah. Well, I I do think oh cinema, but it, it's more of like this this fascination that just keeps driving me back to it, and just that in and of itself yeah. is, is demonstrating the 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 craft and the artistry that's that's going on behind his his work. Yeah. See, for me, I Love just it. I get a very particular feeling that if I don't have it, then. That's fair enough. And, and I'm, I'm trying to make the argument that I think Antonioni is the kind of director that you won't get that feeling. It's a different feeling. I got that at. feeling with blow up. Interesting. OK, I had that feeling with blow up. Well, then um, we'll, we'll see what uh, what Laventura has in store and, and maybe a rewatch for Luke Lee's eventually. It'll be a bit before we get to, to Laventura. Yeah. It's, it's high, much higher up on the list. Interesting. Yeah. Looking, maybe I'll watch it ahead of time so I can have a, have a fully formed second opinion. It is a movie I had to watch twice to enjoy. Anyway. Mm. What are we uh, what are we watching next week? Are we are we still doing North by Northwest? No time to die. Or are we just jumping into spooky stuff? Here's the thing. I, I, I am in the mood for North by Northwest. I am not in the mood to go to a theater and watch No Time to Die. I, I can't get myself <laughs> to do that at the moment. It's two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, is it that long? Yeah. It's that long. Goodness. Yes. Is there is there a, a spy thriller horror movie we could pair to <laughs> North by North? We're just not North by Northwest. I, I mean, if you really want, we could do North by Northwest Arsenic and Old Lace. Arsenic and Old Lace is not necessarily a horror movie. but It, it is a, it's a Halloween movie. It's true. Um, but if not, we can find something else. We'll find something else. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, that was our uh, those were our reviews of Brief Encounter and Lacleese. Oh, I um, brief briefly because I need to go eat dinner. Um, mm. uh, briefly, I will uh, make mention of Brief Encounter and Lacleese. I, I paired them together. And I think it'd be an, oh, an, yeah. an interesting thing to uh, if you like uh, engaging with cinema, dear, dear listener, dear viewer, um, and you want to kind of like look at the extreme opposite ends of the spectrum you have a brief encounter which is very much a a classically made film it has a a clear progression of scenes mm -hmm. that are you know they're they're not linearly ordered but they are the the connective tissue is very much there in between scenes and cutting it makes sense it is it, it's very traditional in its filmmaking 
Um, and it is a film very much trying to evoke emotion. It's trying to accomplish what cinema typically tries to accomplish in the ways that it tri typically tries to do so. Um, and Laclis is a, a likewise a film about a fleeting romance um, that it's obvious once you've seen the film, but I think it's pretty obvious that it's a it's about a doomed love affair, um, a, a an equally brief encounter. I don't think Alain Delon and Monica so you don't Vidi. think uh, they're going to stay together no. at the end. No. I didn't either. And I think yeah, you you can read that ending scene as a as a few different things, but I also think it's it's one of the most infamous and I think one of the most interesting final scenes in a film where it's just this. It's very odd. Long montage of of absence nothingness the creepy music. existential horror there you go there's a that to the start our coaching nuclear yeah to start our spooked over we got michelangelo's <laughs> in, intellectual existential horror <laughs> and we're gonna slowly go in from that to synecdoche new york back to it's such a beautiful day <laughs> and then we'll get into real spooky horror you know uh, two films about uh, beautiful couples in their brief encounter and uh, how uh, society and life brings them together and then ultimately separates them. Yeah. Uh, both are are wildly different. And I think it's Very just different. perhaps interesting to think of them and the different ways that cinema can accomplish these similar, oh, similar, type similar type stories, similar type stories, but very different, saying very different things, doing very different things. Cinema's nuts, guys. It is nuts. Whoa. And I think uh, Leclise more than blow up. Here's my other my other point for why it's on should be on the BFI list. Um, OK, is that it expresses. Something. Whatever that may be in a very individualistic way that has never been repeated in, in the history of cinema and whatever it says, that's the I, we've already tried to unpack some of that. But it is stylistically, you know, you can you can tell that they're similar blow up in it, but they're just they're they're very different. And I, I don't think that there is a better. Evocation of alienation and as existentialism in cinema than Lickley's. Um And, you know, mm. the same goes for La Ventura. So we'll see when we get there for a, a final judgment. Um, but I think, you know, one of the criteria i use for for looking at like what's one of the best movies ever made because you know there's a lot of movies that just get things perfectly aesthetically and all that kind of stuff like silence of the lambs a perfect movie um and whether you put it on the the best films of all time list depends on how you view it at least for me in terms of like uniqueness and, and its, yeah. its stature within the history of cinema and i think this this has the stature of of doing something and expressing something unique that that has not been surpassed elsewhere. Hmm. There you go. There you go. Hey, there is as simple as that. Yeah, I love it. That's all, folks. Those are our reviews. Let us know what you think if you've seen either of those movies and whatever. All right. Well, thanks for watching. See you, gamers. Mm -hmm.